Hi, I'm Dr. Mary Jo Podgorski, and I am very thrilled to spend some time with you talking about my latest nonny book. I'm a nonny, which is just grandma in Italian, and I've written 12 nonny books that I think will inspire a connection between young people and trusted adults, parents, guardians, coaches, anybody who's willing to sit down with a young person and talk about the tough topics. And that's what these are, they're tough topics. So launching for Mental Health Month is again, my 12th, Nani Talks About Mental Health. I'm gonna talk with you about how this book works and how it can be used to improve conversations and maybe most importantly, have young people figure out that it's not a stigma to get help, especially when they're afraid of what will happen if they get to see a counselor. I'm, I'm a counselor. I'm troubled a lot by the way young people think they'll be labeled or they think they have to shake it off and make themselves better. This is a common complaint. I've worked with young people for a very long time. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't see that changing over the years. In fact, I think it's a little worse right now. There seems to be a sense of denial about mental health. I'm particularly concerned since COVID started. I, I believe, and a lot of people believe this as well, that there's a second pandemic. There's a mental health pandemic that we are pretty much not equipped to cover. Most of us who are working with young people or I guess older individuals as well are swamped. We're really, really busy. So. Let me give you a little ray of hope about ways to teach about mental health. Obviously, I think this is one of the good ways. Um, so let me share this with you. My stories are about two little children, Tamika and Alex. They actually are real people, except they're grown now. I have a peer educator program where I teach young people how to teach with me. I've always believed that teens react better to messages given to them from teens not necessarily older people. And I wasn't always this old, but when I started out, I started out in 1988 with peer education. But even then I realized if you have a 16 year old talking to a 13 year old, the message is gonna be heard very well. And that's what I'm shooting for. So the two children in the book, the two characters in all my 12 Nani books are Tamika and Alex, and they are based on two of my former peer educators who are now in their 40s. So um, I've been around a long time and they're lovely characters. Alex in the book is supposed to be my, my grandson. So let me first welcome you. We will get to all these good informational pieces that I hope you will enjoy about Nani Talks About Mental Health. But first I wanna make sure you understand that I am grateful for your time in today's very busy, moving, fast world. Um, time is a great gift. So I will not squander my time with you. I hope you will enjoy it as much as I will. I believe this, this is a fundamental belief philosophy, if you will, of me, each person is a person of worth. I do not believe we have to earn worthiness. I believe it is something we are born with. However, a lot of young people don't feel self-worth. I've had many superintendents and principals ask me over the last four decades, and more to come to a school and do an assembly on self-esteem or self-worth. And I do, but I think it's really important that everyone understand you cannot give self-esteem or self-worth to a children, uh, to any children rather as a bolus, as a, here you go. It doesn't work that way. You have to drip self-worth and self-esteem into a child. You have to give affirmations, positive, real, affirmations daily to get a young person to believe that they are worthy. So I think if we could give this awakening of their own self-worth to young people, a lot of the decisions they make would be more healthy. They would take fewer risks if they valued themselves. And that's the premise behind all the work that I do. So I always set the stage when I teach. Um, I create an environment that I hope will be safe and warm and welcoming. And so that's what I'm gonna do first, because this is important. People don't learn when they're frightened. They don't learn when they're hungry. If I were with you in person, I would feed you. That's the Italian in me, but I would feed you. 
So this is my primary guideline or promise, and that is that I respect people. I do. I respect individuals for their own worth, and I try very hard to respect groups as well. In my teen center, I run a teen center called the Common Ground Teen Center. We have these guidelines, respect one another, listen to hear, which is different than listening to respond, it's essentially reflective or active listening, honor diversity, hold space. Now, I was a hospice nurse at one time and holding space is a hospice term. It really means being there. You know, when you go to a funeral home, everyone speaks softly. And then after you give your condolences to the loved ones, you find a place to sit and you simply do sit. And that is the whole purpose of holding space to offer the gift of your presence without judgment by being there. I've done that a lot, not just as a hospital nurse, but also as a doula, a birth and death doula. Talk about that in a minute. And we also strive to avoid judgment. We have other little things. Um, the young people have cards that say these things. I pass, I don't have to play a game or do an activity if I don't want to. Too much, which is really how you say that's more than I wanna talk about. Too gross, um, if you're talking about some complicated things like sexuality, young people, especially fourth and fifth graders, they need these kinds of stop cards. Um, boring is that we really will shoot not to be boring and, I, I work hard at not having that card be shown. Like to explain again, the young people have these cards. They're on a little spiral ring and they can hold them up and, and give me input even if they don't want to talk. And one speaker, anyone can speak in my classes. Anyone is always interactive, but we do have one person talk at a time. And the young people are very good at, at policing one another, if you will. They'll hold up a card if people are talking out of turn. Again, we want people to be safe. Here's another one. Um, confidentiality, which means we do not spread rumors and that goes closely with no names. I don't allow young people to tell me stories about other people. They can make up names like Barbie and Ken or Buzz Like You and Woody or whatever they want, but they cannot say my friend so-and-so because that just spreads rumors and we don't do that. Um, power of words is a guideline that means that words do have power. So I will not permit any words that would hurt someone that was racist or judgmental in terms of ability or age or gender or sexuality. So I'm very careful to set a stage where people know they'll be safe and we want them to ask questions. So we get, I have a curiosity bag that makes them uh, free to ask anything they want. What I always do with this, which I think is, is interesting um, is I have them all right. So everybody gets a pencil and a little piece of paper and they write either the words, I don't have anything I'm curious about today or I don't have any questions or they actually write a question. And I never answer questions in front of young people. I fold them all up, of course, and I take them home and I open them and I type them up. And the next time I teach, I weave in these answers um, without them even knowing that someone had asked a question that I'm answering. Um, I also have one thing that I wanted to share with you with the slides off, and this is my opinion hat. Um, the Teen Outreach is what I founded and in 1988, and it, it simply means that, and I don't know if that's mirrored backwards or not with you, it says Teen Outreach Opinion Hat. I put it on my head to prove that, um, frankly, I will not hold anybody's opinions against them. I also differentiate opinion from fact. I don't give my opinions to young people, but if they say, what do you believe? I always put the hat on and say, you gotta remember, this is not a fact, this is an opinion. So let me move forward and go back to my slides. And if we were together, this is when I would say, do you have any questions? Put them in the chat, let's talk. Um, I give people my cell phone all the time. Come on, I just believe in doing that. So these are our guidelines. This is me. I always say my foundation is my media family and my family. That's an old picture. Oh, with COVID, we haven't all gotten together. There are now 14 of us. Um, the tiny baby in um, my daughter in love arms is now um, almost four. And the little guy on the other side of my daughter's arms is four. And we have a new baby 
my daughter and her husband have had a little girl who is 15 months. So this is what gives me joy and strength. This is my background. My first job as a nurse, I graduated in nursing in 1970. My first job as a nurse was at Children's in Pittsburgh. And then I worked at Slum Kettering in New York City. Um, that was a pivotal changing moment for me, a life changing moment. Um, it was a strong experience. We had a lot of children die and I probably had 10 to 11 children's bodies that needed wrapped during that time. It really uh, brought me up short, made me think about my mortality. It was a very powerful experience. Um, then I came to Pennsylvania and um, became certified as a Lamaze educator. That would have been 1976. Um, I worked in hospice. So I was working in birth and in death at the same time, which is an interesting but beautiful experience. I'm certified in sexuality education and sexuality counseling from this organization, ASEP. Um, I am trained as a parents' teacher. Um, we teach using that for parenting classes. I'm a master facilitator for Darkness to Light, which is a um, child abuse prevention program with a great deal of wonderful research behind it that targets adults. Um, I, know, I, am, I am, excuse me, an Olveus Bullying Prevention Program trainer. Um, this is a job where you go into schools and train the entire system from bus drivers all the way up to superintendents and students on how to prevent bullying in the school. It's a lot of effort, but it's the only kind of bullying prevention that has been shown um, with nice evidence-based data that it works. So I'm one of those people. This is a picture from when I first started teaching sexuality in schools, uh, 1988, as I said, I have taught, my staff and I have taught a, a quarter million young people since then. So let's begin. Why would I take this on? I've taken on some really tough topics. I've done, Monty talks about death, Monty talks about birth, Monty talks about consent, Monty talks about trauma, We've looked at puberty and sex and quarantine. I, I wrote a book in three weeks in March of 2020 called Nani Talks About Quarantine and I gave it away as a free PDF download. I gave it over to 500 people, over 500 people downloaded it. And one of the hardest books I did was Nani Talks About Relationships because there are so many kinds of relationships. It took me a long time to finish that one. And this is the last. All the books start the same way. So they have the first two pages are exactly the same. And it introduces Alex and Tamika. When I first wrote the book, the first one I wrote was Nadia Talks About Gender and that was 2014. And the children were supposed to be in fifth or sixth grade then. And then we moved them up. And so as I end Nadia Talks About Mental Health, they're entering eighth grade next year. So all of the pages in the book are different. Of course, they're very interactive and they're color coded. All the red words are in the glossary, very complete glossary at the back of each book. I have appendices in the books um, that give resources. And in Nanya Talks About Mental Health, I'm very pleased that I have permission for the founders of Yellow Ribbons Anti-Suicide Program to use their information. And um, they also endorse the book, which was quite, quite excellent. I used to teach in the late 90s with the Yellow Ribbon Program. And it is a peer-driven program to help, um, help teens, help other teens. Young people tell each other they're depressed before they tell anybody else. The picture on the bottom with the yellow um, tablet is intermittent. It changes in terms of words, but it's intermittent throughout the Nani books. And this is when a young person is supposed to sit down with an adult and tell them what they think. So this one is about the beginning. Why do you think they were angry? Because in the beginning, they are angry about something. So why do I think I can talk about mental health? Well, I did my um, master's in counseling. I did my first counseling in 82. Um, and I, as I said, I'm a doula. And a doula is somebody who supports people typically in birth. I've been a birth doula for a very long time, over four decades, except that I don't do the doula work for fees, I do it for teens. We have a program for young parents in my teen outreach and I don't charge to see teens as a doula, but I am with them while they have babies. And death doula would be the same idea. You're with somebody at the end of life, holding space, being there. So why would we talk about this? I think as I mentioned, COVID has really exposed how we don't have enough mental health 
care, literally, not just facilities, but counselors to reach out to families and to have families reach out to them. We have some really scary data about suicide rates, young people taking their own life. Um, that's the terminology I use, words really matter. So I, I typically say it that way. Um, technically we've got some challenges for our youngest. So let's talk about non-aid books. Again, I'm always trying to address the elephant in the room. I think that's really key. So I do that. Okay, so I began very bravely, bravely rather with suicide. It's not a common thing to talk about with young people, but it happens. During COVID, um, we initiated Zooms in my teen center. We had to close the teen center on March 16th and I opened Zooms twice a day on March 17th. So we stayed connected with these young people virtually until it opened again in September. We also ran summer camps. We did all we could virtually to connect with young people. And there were six times when a young person talked about suicide, uh, talked about taking their own life, that we were able to get support from them and help, even though we were virtual. So I think this is a very real thing to look at. In the book, I wanted it to be not the children that were always using in the book, not those characters, but someone that was already introduced in one of the other books. So Tamika's older brother, LeBron, is in college in the story. And they, Tamika and Alex sort of like him. He's fun. Um, he plays video games with them. He just is a good big brother. And he comes home from college and he won't, he's not himself. He doesn't, he just doesn't act like him. And they're very confused. They don't understand what that means, what's going on with him. What happens is that the parents, um, LeBron and Tamika's parents talk about what did happen in LeBron's life. He was at college and his best friend who his roommate, uh, Josh, he came back from class and his roommate was unconscious. He had taken pills. And so LeBron did all the right things. He called and got help and Josh survived, but he's having a hard time. He came home right after this incident and he's having a hard time shaking this memory. And the reason I brought this up in the books is because anyone around a young person who even considers taking their own life is affected by that. All the young people are. It makes them question their own self. It makes them think, am I that depressed? Would I do that? And that's one of the themes in the book. Um, and so of course we have uh, one, of the, one of the yellow interactive pages. Tamika said her brother, LeBron is a, has a big sad, she, he's big sad. So I talk about that. Is that, is feeling sad okay? Is it common? Common's highlighted in red because that is a, a, a um, glossary word. And I ask the young people, when I do these books, by the way, I do focus groups. I do a focus group with third and fourth graders, one with fifth and sixth graders, and one with seventh and eighth graders. And it is important to me to hear, to listen to hear what young people say. So this is just one of the um, interactive pages in Money Talks About Mental Health. I'm gonna jump um, because otherwise I have a time constraint with you. We can't do the whole book, but I will tell you that eventually um, we end up talking about what happens, learning from other young people, learning about what they have experienced. And I use an analogy that I always use. I talk about the difference between a physical problem and a mental health problem. And no one says, you have a broken leg, shake it off, get better on your own because physical problems are respected. And the young people in my focus groups brought this up as well. Um, we talk about self-worth. Again, I've told you that is really important to me. And I have to make it, the character says, I think I know why Josh took the pills. He forgot he was worthy. And they're searching to make an Alex to figure out, was there anything they could have done why is LeBron blaming him? And LeBron's feeling it was his fault because he didn't pick up on Josh's depression, on his roommate's depression. He didn't pick up on that. And we, we carry this theme throughout the book that you are worthy. Alex is starting in this page to reveal that he was depressed during the COVID lockdown. He doesn't like learning virtually. And he didn't want to tell Nani because he didn't want to disappoint her. And this is something else I'm bringing home strongly in Nani talks about mental health. The fact that really 
young people hide things. They can mask, they can put layers of defense systems and the people they should tell the most are the people they love the most and they don't wanna let them down. So that's very powerful. And Alex's fear is what Josh did frightened him. What if he gets depressed again as he was during the pandemic? So we talk about a lot of different things. I'm jumping ahead, obviously, but one of the big things we talk about is finding a trusted adult. The 20, page 26 has a, a, a male child and page 27 uh, uh, looks like a female child. One never knows, but that's what it looks like. And I have uh, an artist, my artist drew all the different, a few kinds of people that young people might seek to speak with as a trusted adult. And I put this, these two pages in because not every child has a parent that they can trust. That's especially true when there's abuse in the family. One of the things that haunted me the most, and my staff and I work with abuse, with uh, mostly sexual abuse, which is difficult to work with or talk about. Um, that's why I wrote, Nani talks about consent. Um, and I also wrote another book called Inside Out, Your Body's Amazing, Inside and Out Belongs Only to You, that looks at teaching children about their bodies and how they are their own but doesn't make them feel like they have to stop someone who hurts them because it's not their fault if an adult does. There's no power in a child, honestly. So this is a good page to talk about the young people and who they're trusted adults. Hopefully the person they're working with, reading the book with is their trusted adult. And then I, in chapter six, the books are very small chapters, but I tell people in the, in the foreword that they should really pick the chapter as their child is ready. So go forward. And I've had people use this with younger people too, five and six and seven. I just started third grade because the reading level is about that level. Um, but if you read to a child, it could be younger. So I use something from my own life. I am um, a breast cancer survivor twice, two different kinds of breast cancers that aren't related, one 2005 and one 2019. And I uh, finished a year of chemo and had a difficult surgery. So I pulled this in. And I use my own family as a guide. And my granddaughter, who um, is, was nine when I was diagnosed and is almost 11 now, really had a hard time with me being sick. She didn't want this to happen to me. And I used her as, as a, she's not a character, but as a catalyst for bringing this up. Because this is what depresses Alex. He's very unhappy initially. Uh, about the COVID and the lockdown, but that passes and he's back at school and then this happens. So we, Nani begins to see a pattern. She begins to be concerned is, is he depressed on a regular basis and he's not telling us. So we're talking about cancer on this page. And in the book, I actually do what I did in real life. I have the children come to my house and put my chemo caps and my wigs on. I bought a pink one, a blue one, uh, purple one. And so my, my granddaughter was much happier. We laughed, we had snacks. Um, like I said, I like to feed people, but it was good before I lost my hair. Um, and then she wasn't as afraid when it actually happened. But this is talking about um, Alex and how he's, he's changing. And because he's not allowed to see um, Nani for a while, she has to stay isolated. He does not like that. And so we get him to the point where he's willing to talk to a, a doctor. And I, the two consulting authors for this book are two um, psychi psychologists, rather. And Dr. Bob Rubin is one and Dr. Bob is another. And they gave me some wonderful words for this. Even though I am a counselor, I wanted other people's perspective. And um, the, sometimes people talk about a weight. And Dr. Rubin said that one of the suggestions he makes to young people is, does it feel like a backpack? on your shoulders, this weight that you feel, this sadness. Um, and it, 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 we have Dr. Rubin meet with him, talk with him, talk with um, Nani and Tamika and Alex. And, and Tamika is very much Alex's good friend. She is consistently in his life. She does things that make him feel better. She provides affirmations. He does the same for her. They have a very nice friendship. So then we talk about what counseling is like um, we talk about how young people should react to what they know about counseling. How do they feel? Would they feel safe if, you, if they had a counselor like Dr. Rubin? And then we go again to learn from other young people. And these are characters in the other books. Hillary is a character that was in the Nani Talks About Consent book. And she experienced unwanted touch and went to counseling for that. And we talk about that. Hillary, 
as a character is how I introduce to the children this kind of need for counseling. And then I have a wonderful peer educator. She actually is my consulting author and Melanie talks about disability. Um, she has used the wheelchair her whole life. She has a, a very severe um, muscular dystrophy, a type that is at birth. And she's amazing. She just is finishing her freshman year at college, the college I teach at it, Washington Jefferson College. But she was a peer educator with me. She taught with me from ninth grade on. And she helped me write nine talks about disability. And she became a character in the book. So we pulled her back into this one. Um, and in relationships, the nine talks of relationship book, Kendall and Alex had a crush. I did that because I wanted very much to model that people of all abilities can have a crush, can fall in love, can be attracted to people. But I also had them break up because that's realistic at seventh grade level. Um, and so Kendall, I pull Kendall into this book because she talks about what she does to maintain positive mental health, how she stays mentally healthy. She has physical challenges, but Kendall is actually one of the most together young people I've ever met. She handles her challenges well. And she talks about how she handles it on the next couple of pages. And then we talk about peer pressure. Again, I'm learning from the other young people. I'm pulling in characters um, that if the kids have read the books, they would know them, but you can read each Nani book independently. You don't have to read the others. So we talk about peer pressure here. Annie is a girl in Nani Talks About Sex who had shown sent graphic pictures on her phone, very important topic to teach about. And she talks about peer pressure and how she ended up in counseling because of what she did um, and that she didn't wanna go. And that was good. And then the children's character, um, the character friend Darius loses his father when he's eight and he's now in eighth grade, seventh grade or eighth grade. I think he's older than them. I think he's supposed to be. Um, I think it's supposed to be in eighth grade already, yes. But it, we talk about reasons for counseling then. He had a stepmom, he lost his dad. His parents got divorced. He didn't really like his stepmom at first. I mean, these are the kinds of things that kids need counseling for. And so I talk about grief. We also talk about things like PTSD, even though that's associated with war, it also can happen to children, especially after trauma. We talk about trauma. And Tamika's Abuelito, who is her grandpa, um, was the character that dies and Nina talks about death. Um, there was a pet that died first unexpectedly. And we talk about that. And then we talk about her Abuelito who takes a while to die and has palliative care and hospice. And he was a veteran. And she talks about that. And she goes to see his wife, her grandma, who tells him that he had PTSD after he returned from the war, which was Vietnam. We talk about that and that's helpful. And then we move to learning together, learning from family, learning from friends. Our teen center is a big family. So we have everybody come together. Um, Dr. Bob, the other consultant from my book is online and Dr. Rubin's in person. This is how we operate now, we're hybrid. Some people are at the center, some people are online. We talk a lot about why would you need counseling? Is it okay to need counseling? What happens if you need counseling? Should you be ashamed of needing counseling? One of, the, one of the comments in the book is that one of the doctors say at every at some time in their life, most people could use counseling. That was one of my professors in my master's program said that many years ago, but I think it's true. We all go through moments when support would be really helpful. And again, what I'm trying to do through all these pages is talk with them, help them get to the point where they see that the stigma associated with mental illness is wrong, literally wrong. So we, this is them talking. And Dr. Bob has the best stories and he talks about Goldilocks in real life when he works with young people. And he talks about how that story is about perfection. The porridge is too hot, the porridge is too cold, the chair is too hot, the chair is too soft, hard rather, the chair is too soft, da 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 da. And he thinks perfection or the search for it causes inadequacy. And a lot of the data on mental health with young people has to do with expectations, whether they're athletic or academic, that children, when they're in a very competitive environment where they're receiving pressure from home or from school can become anxious. They can develop all types of fears um, 
they can not feel good about themselves. They can stagger a little bit with self-worth, that they are worthy. And so that's how a counselor can help. Um, and then we finally talk about self-care. So with chapter 11, again, I am, I am jumping through the book. It's, it's 70 pages, not counting the appendix and the glossary. Um, so we jump right to talking about breathing and relaxation, meditation, and I have a whole appendix, appendix rather, on this so people can read it in detail. And we talk about laughing, of course. And then what I thought was fun was when I end the, end the book, chapter 12, we talk about healthy relationships. So I pull together the last book, Nani talks about relationships, and to make an Alex, they're having lunch with Nani. She always feeds them. That's the cover of the book. And they reveal something. They reveal that they have decided they have a crush on each other. And Nani talks about it with them and tells them that she thinks having a crush on somebody who's your friend is a very nice place to start. So when, then we end up, what did you learn about mental health? What is mental health stigma? Are you surprised to make an Alex became a couple? Why or why not? That's our final, what do you think? So I ended the book with one of the appendixes, appendices rather has artwork from young people um, because I wanted to make sure this is an art, this is young people expressing themselves. That's part of the book. Um, so perspective came from one of my former peer educators um, and she was 18 when she drew this and had a diagnosis of bipolar, which I thought was uh, a very expressive way to say it. So there are five pictures in the book and this is where I would normally stop and ask if people have questions and I will do this whenever we can speak. I do need to share with you and you'll probably laugh at this. Of all the questions I've gotten in all these years, this one is my favorite. I had a fourth grader say, do you have a license to talk about this stuff? I was teaching a class on puberty. <laughs> That's what he wanted to know. I also had a fourth grader ask me once if my mother knew I was talking about this. This is what I'm talking about, their bodies changing. And I think all things considered, they were a little grossed out. And that's what they asked me. Does your mother know about this? So thank you for listening. Um, again, each person is a person of worth. I believe this with all my heart. We're all different, but we are worthy. And these are the Nani books. So Nani talks about consent. Again, is about unwanted touch. Nani talks about death is obvious. And my daughter um, is a palliative care doctor. She's my consulting author with that. Nani talks about disability. Kendall, again, my young peer educator. Nani talks about gender. Nani talks about mental health. Nani talks about pregnancy and birth. Nani talks about puberty. Nani talks about quarantine, which is the one that I shared with you um, that I gave away. Nani talks about race, which I wrote with two amazing professionals that are, that are dear friends of mine who are people of color because I could only go so far in this book. So they take it over. Um, to make and Alex have lots of questions, we answer them in that one. There's that formidable Nani talks about relationships. Nani talks about sex. And finally, Nani talks about trauma. I did this alphabetically, not in the way they were written. And I did trauma after Parkland, after the um, gun shooting, the, the deaths at Parkland. And again, it's very interesting. The focus groups are always so powerful. In the mental health one, I had a young person share, and this is in the book in one of the appendices, that her dad had to have a counseling. And until her dad got counseling, she was often afraid that he would hurt himself. And after he got counseling and was put on medication that he takes, she reminds him to take it every day. Um, and she was a seventh grader, I think, or I'm not exactly sure, but I think she was a seventh grader in the focus group. But she said, it's so much better, life is better. And she's not as afraid for him. So I think one of the things my, my theme is not he talks about fear, although that's not the title of any book. I wanna pull out the things people don't talk about. I wanna, instill young people, empower young people with the belief that they can ask an adult that they trust. And I want, really want adults to talk about the elephant in the room. We don't do that enough. We often think young people don't hear or understand and they hear and they know and they're confused. And again, because they don't wanna disappoint us, they may not ask us. They may go to friends with questions about these difficult, tough topics, but mm, Friends are not exactly as as versed as, as adults should be with this. So this is how people reach me. 
I would like to spend a few minutes just talking with you. Let me see what my time is like, if I have enough time to do that. Um, yes, I think I can. So uh, one of the things that I believe very strongly is adults matter. They really do matter. And teens don't act like they do. But trust me, they really hear you. They hear what you say. They watch your body language. They model what you do. As working with young parents for decades, I um, we did a video back in 1998 uh, about the myths associated with early childbearing. A lot of people don't know the sexual abuse is, is a um, antecedent of that. So it's poverty, internal, no self-worth, external poverty. So in the video, I have a young woman say, I'm following my mom's path. And her mother always had a partner who was abusive. And less than a month after we filmed this video, her boy, this young, this young mother's boyfriend broke her jaw. So young people hear what we say, but they really model what we do. Emerson said that. Emerson said, what you do speak so loudly. I cannot hear what you say. It is very challenging to know that some young people don't have adults in their lives that they can speak with, which is why I'm there, which is why my staff is there. I will tell you a very quick story. Um, probably 15 years ago, I've been doing this a long time, as I said. I taught a class of sophomores in high school and I always write my name on the board and I don't, nobody calls me Dr. Mary Jo, it's Mary Jo. So I write my name and my cell number. Before there was a cell, I had a pager. Before there was a pager, I had my home number, but I've always had the ability to take calls from kids or adults and I never turn my phone off. When I had my surgery, um, I'm about 10 hours post bilateral mastectomy and I took a call from a kid. My husband was like, what are you doing? But they don't call me unless they're in crisis. They are respectful of my time. In any case, I put my name on the board, this 15 year ago experience. And I said, call me if you need me. And I got a call on a Sunday morning. I was getting to go to church and I never made it to church because this young woman called to tell me she'd been sexually assaulted during the night. And she has no one else to tell. She had told her father it happened in her home with a friend of her father's and her father said that she was making it up. So I did all the things you have to do as a mandated reporter, I called children and youth. I, I called the police. I made sure she was safe. Long story, but bottom line, I was subpoenaed and I spoke um, at, at the trial. When it was all over, she sent me this absolutely magnificent letter full of nice words, generous words, thanking me. And I cried, not because it was a beautiful letter, but because I was so sad that she didn't have anybody to go to, but a person she'd met once, one time. And one of my passions in life is that children should not have. They should not have to find even a nice stranger. They should have somebody close to them, a mother, a father, a grandma, a grandpa, a big sister, a uncle, an aunt, a coach, a teacher, a youth pastor. I don't care. So one of the, my goals in Nani books, and especially when I talk about mental health, is to open the door to conversation and make connection happen. With connection, there's a possibility of healing as a possibility of growth. So thank you for listening to me. I really enjoyed filming this. I hope you enjoy watching it. Um, may you be well and remember that you are worthy. Thanks a lot.